Please join me this afternoon in giving a big BW welcome to the president of the Cleveland Indians, Mr. Mark Shapiro. Thank you. Go Jackets. Happy Mother's Day. Happy, go Tribe too. Happy, my, I've got, you see me looking down in my pocket, it's because my phone might be buzzing at the uh, scoring alerts. Hopefully they're moving in the right direction. Some of you can let me know. It, it, it truly is an honor to be here today, and, and I think President Helmer spoke to reason why, that my ties to BW are, are not just geared around today. You know, they're deep and they're genuine. They're tied to professors like Alan Culp. They're tied to students and, and administrators. They're tied to people I met at the Center for Innovation and Growth. They're tied to a, a host of student athletes across every sport and coaches across every sport as well that I've had the pleasure and honor to interact with. In fact, I texted with Coach Snell this morning and it's hard to believe that he can even be motivational through text. So I know the football players laughed when I said that out there. It really is an honor to be here today and I am left with a couple thoughts. As I, I will tell you, I have to confess, this is my first college commencement address. So I talked to President Helmer before I came here today and I asked President Helmer, what, what advice would you give me? He said, one, be brief. I thought you'd applaud that one. <laughs> Two, be transformative, inspirational, have fun. That doesn't sound very easy. So I went to the next step and I, and I searched on the internet, great commencement addresses. <laughs> Two takeaways from doing that. One, I hope none of you searched great commencement addresses prior to hearing me today. That's a pretty tough standard. And two, if you ever get asked to deliver a commencement address, do not, I repeat, do not search great commencement addresses and watch it before you go up. That's a pretty intimidating high bar. Well, I'm left with, in my diminishing time, that, that charge that, that President Helmer said to leave you with some inspirational message. And I find that whenever I think about those types of things, and I, it's a tremendous opportunity for me to reflect on myself as well as my professional experiences. And what always comes back to me is the amazing tie between the things that I've seen professionally and the things that I've encountered personally. Probably most importantly, and maybe most important to you as you begin this next juncture, the tie between professional and personal fulfillment and happiness. Because it's the same values, it's the same beliefs, it's the same standards and expectations that I've seen in people regardless of their walk in life whether it's coaches, whether it's teachers, whether it's athletes or leaders in every sector of life, I've seen the same principles and values in the most fulfilled and happy people, which translates to successful people to me. And I've always aspired to lead in a sustainable way. And to be a sustainable leader, there can be no division between the person you are and the leader you are. So it's whether I'm on the field with Corey Kluber and Jason Kipnis, talking about baseball, whether I'm on the youth field with my 11-year-old son's team, the same beliefs, values, standards, and expectations are the things that I communicate every day. And it struck me, as I think about what I wanted to convey to you, that similar principles are applicable to you as you begin this juncture in life. And the traits that I look for in people that I work for, people that I work with, people that work for me, and really the friends that I've got, are the same things that would be most applicable to you today. There are questions I always ask myself before we hire someone, draft someone, trade for someone. Three questions that come to mind, things like, is it important to them? Do they take pride in it? You know, how important is it to you? Is it personal to you? Two, are they able to adapt, learn? Are they seeking to be continuously improving and developing? Three, are they consistent? Are they dependable, reliable people? Now, I could give you an hour lecture on each one of those, but the last thing you need today is one more lecture. So I force myself, is there one thing? Is there one separator? Is there one differentiator that if I could talk to you for just a few minutes today that I could leave you with to think about? And I thought about this one. If I had to ask, if I had to impart one thing to you today that I look at, in people that I surround myself with, the people that I want to surround myself with, in people that I see successful in every single walk of life, it is simply this. I look at how they handle real adversity. When they face challenges, when they face disappointment, when they face setbacks, do they shriek from them for fear of their limitations or failures being exposed? Or do they bow up and do they find a way to learn, to improve, to grow and develop from those setbacks? 
So it's simply that. It's how they face challenges. I'm looking for people that are tough. I'm looking for people that face them with determination, regardless of the outcome, knowing they'll get better. That's true toughness. Toughness is a word that gets overused and abused frequently. Toughness is a word that too often means I'm going to physically stand up to someone if, the, if we're challenged. Toughness in my world means I'm going to play when hurt. But that's not when tough, what toughness truly is. Toughness truly is striving and carrying on to be better in the face of a setback. Toughness is resolve. It's grit. It's determination. That's what toughness is in the greatest sense of the world. Well, let me tell you, leadership in my world necessitates toughness every single that that grit and that resolve and that resilience every single day. I live in a world in baseball where Major League Baseball system doesn't share revenue evenly, and just, we live in a market that's obviously one of the smallest in all of Major League Baseball with different regional reach and all the other challenges that come with that and revenues and resources. In fact, while we're judged on outcomes that are identical to all our competitors, wins and losses, very simply, the resources that go into those wins and losses sometimes are half or less than half of our competitors. The way we handle that is to not find people who make excuses, because their excuses are very, re very real and very objective. We find incremental people throughout our entire organization. We empower people to contribute. We're able to think about overcoming those challenges and charting a plan and a strategy. My job is to ensure that every single person that come in realizes that not only are they empowered to contribute to our success, our success is dependent upon them contributing. Whether it's an intern crunching film in the middle of the night in the cubicle, whether it's a trainer in 100 degree heat in Arizona rehabbing a player, or whether it's a senior leader of our organization. Our success and our future is dependent on every single one of them realizing the direct tie they've got to the outcome. Not only in, in the offices for us, but when I think about what's the best example of this, I think about a very recent one with a player. I think about a guy named Michael Brantley. I'm guessing that a few of you might be familiar with Michael. Michael's a 26-year-old outfielder in the organization. Anyone here know his nickname? Dr. Smooth? Yeah. And recently, Michael, Michael left spring training, one of our best offensive players, had an incredible spring, went into the season, had an incredible season, start to the season, and then we went to the West Coast. We had a West Coast swing last week. That West Coast swing was a rough one, not just rough for Michael, it was rough for our team as well. We went winless, six games without a win. And on that same trip, Michael went hitless. Six games, zero hits. This is a guy that went in achieving a lot of success. And it's a guy that, let me tell you, we bought into not just as a player. Talent naturally gets you to a certain level. Talent leads you to a certain place. But we bought into him because of what he could control, the controllables beyond his talent. Because when I think about those three questions, does he love baseball? Yes, he loves baseball and he takes it personally. Is he looking to get better? He's constantly looking to get better. Is he consistent? He's incredibly consistent in his practice and in his process. So when Michael encountered his adversity and his setbacks, what did he do? Did he sit around feeling sorry for himself? Well, let me flash forward just a couple days. That, that road trip ended on a Wednesday night. The team flew all night on a red eye back and landed at 7.30 in the morning in Cleveland on that Thursday morning. That Friday, we, we started a new series. And I walked down in the, in the underground area of the ballpark in the con underground concourse that Friday morning. As I walked by the batting cages, I heard that familiar sound. I heard crack, crack, crack. Now it's 10 a.m. on a Friday morning, and no major league hitter hits at 10 a.m. Doesn't happen. You know, so I figure there's no way a player's in there. And listen, nobody's even around. You know, when the team's flown all night and they're about to start a series, most guys have slept all day the day before. They're still recovering. We went winless. You know, so I peeked in. I figured maybe it was the coach's son. I looked in the cages, and there was Michael Brantley off a tee all alone, taking swings, working on what he could control, working on his practice, intently practicing, working on his craft, his process. Because Michael had a setback. Michael struggled. He was 0 for 6 games. And let me tell you something. 0 for 6 games is a bad week that can turn into a bad month, that can turn into a bad season. If you have the wrong mindset, if you fear failure, if you think negatively, but Michael turned it the other way. He said, I'm going to get better from this. I'm not going to give in to this. What can I control? I can control on how intently I can practice. I can, tell, I can control how I respond to this setback. I'm going to get better. I'm going to develop. I'm going to grow. 
Well, that was last Friday night, and I don't know how many of you might have been at that game. But during that game, Michael went out and he was, had three hits. He had a home run. He had five RBI. And as the home run cleared the fence, you know, my thought wasn't on the, the lead that we had for the first time in six days. It wasn't on winning a game. It wasn't on the crowd going nuts. It was on Michael in the cages at 10 a.m. It was on thinking that that is the guy that I want to be around. That's the guy I want to watch play. That's the kind of person I want to work with. That's the kind of person that's successful regardless of their endeavor in life. The person that faces setbacks, challenges, adversity, failures with resilience, resolve, grit, determination, and toughness. Michael wasn't just a good baseball player. He's a person of character in the truest sense of the word. Those are the things that we bought into. And what makes me proud to have him wear an Indian uniform is not the talent he's got, but the person he is, the way he handles himself every single day. I'll leave you with, with you know, these thoughts, that whether we're facing a final hiring decision for an executive or we're talking about the draft board next week because the draft's coming up, I'm going to ask one final question before we make a decision every single time. I'm going to ask, tell me how this person responded in a situation where they encountered real adversity. This is it. Setbacks, challenges, failures. How do you handle it? Can you look at those moments as opportunities to learn, develop, grow, and improve? That's the true determination of character. People who succeed, who find fulfilling careers and have happy lives, do not make excuses. Instead of spending energy offering excuses, even valid ones, they spend time using the challenge to grow, to develop, to chart a new strategy or plan. They take accountability or ownership of their process. Along your journey, results will not be as black and white or constant as baseball statistics and daily wins and losses. Feedback may not be as instantaneous, but this approach, the one that says, I will respond to adversity by simply taking responsibility for course correcting, and drawing strength from the approach that has led to success before will serve you well as it served Michael Brantley. Let me close by reminding you that the real separator, in my experience, is the demonstration of character, toughness, and resilience in the face of adversity. People who take accountability for their process. Whether it's Michael Brantley alone in a batting cage in the bowels of the ballpark at 10 a.m. after a red-eye flight, or an office full of people committed to charting a championship course despite seemingly overwhelming challenges. Or a college student studying while at their job to both pay for and excel in your studies. As you all work in the batting cages of life, you will rise above your challenges with this positive mindset as the differentiator. Be someone who looks at each experience as an opportunity, regardless of outcome, to develop, to improve, and to get better. And that is my wish for you as you leave Baldwin-Wallace and continue what I hope is a fulfilling and purpose-driven life. Congratulations for all you have accomplished and even more for all you will. Congratulations. Go Jackets.